The B-Sides DC 2016 videos are brought to you by clearjobs.net and cybersecjobs.com, tools for your next career move, and Antietam Technologies, focusing on advanced cyber detection, analysis, and mitigation. Well, hi everyone. My name is Gordon Mackay, and we're going to go over my talk today, which is Vulnerability Management Systems FOD, Leaving Your Enterprise at High Risk. But first, let me share a little bit about myself. So I work in San Antonio uh, for digital defense. Um, so just to break the ice, I was born in Montreal, Canada. There's a lot of ice there. And uh, I grew up there and graduated from McGill University with a computer engineering degree. Started working for a telecom company called Northern Telecom Bell Northern Research, later transformed into Nortel now no longer exists. And uh, spent five years there, and because I was in telecom, I thought, uh, where's all the action? And all of the telecom action just happened to be in Dallas, Texas. So I moved my small family to Dallas, Texas in late 1995, just after Christmas, and uh, started working there for a company called Digital Switching Corporation, which was bought by Alcatel. Anyway, um, I did a lot of software over the years, a lot of telecom signaling type software, and telecom was going downhill around the year 2000 or so, and uh, by 2002 I was just about to be laid off and I was starting to look around. And I knew very little about internet security, but I knew a lot about software, and so I met, uh, met these folks, Digital Defense, in San Antonio. They brought me down and uh, I thought, hey, I'm just going to spend a year there or so, maybe go back to Dallas because I really liked it but I'm still there. It's been 14 years, really love it. Um, they brought me on board to actually help them re-architect at the time, many, many moons ago, their uh, immature vulnerability management system. So we took, I took a, a Tiger team of four people with myself and we re-architected it. Um, it's a SaaS-based model. Um, I guess at the time it wasn't called SaaS, but you know, terms change. Um, and so now we're in our sixth iteration. So we do vulnerability management. Uh, I've learned a lot about that across the years and that's what this talk is based on. I've done a lot of studies based on what I'm about to share. And there is a, a limitation or a flaw that I've seen in the industry, um, or rather it's a challenge that all vendors have to overcome. And that's what this talk is about. So hopefully you'll learn something. I've given this talk before and many times, most of the times actually when I've given it, uh, people raise their eyebrows and they're like, wow, why didn't I think of that? Yeah, that makes sense. I didn't realize that that was actually a challenge. Uh, pretty cool, good stuff. Um, so the way that I give this talk nowadays is uh, I don't actually reveal the flaw up front. Um, about three quarters of the way through, I'll say, aha, here's what the problem is. And then we'll talk about consequences, et cetera. And so I invite you, if you can guess this problem, before I get to the end, you just raise your hand and I'll call upon you. And you can sort of shout it out. And if you get the answer correct, I don't have any prizes, but you get recognition. So that's pretty cool, right? Recognition at B-Sides DC, that's pretty cool. This is a pretty big conference. My first time at, uh, at B-Sides DC. Not at, not at various other B-Sides, but anyway, I digress. So let's kick it off by sharing a use case. And there are many different use cases that sort of highlight this challenge. But in this specific risk use case, what I'm sharing is a hypothetical situation, right? So don't go to this room and say, well, Gordon just revealed a zero day vulnerability because that's not the case, right? But let's assume that a recently announced zero day just came out, let's say today or yesterday, that, um, where Apache, mo the most, uh, the earlier versions, so 2.4.0 to 2.4.22, is vulnerable to some really serious, you know, flaw, um, but it's not impactful to the most recent release. Okay, what would you do as a security professional to understand what your risk is across your organization? Right. So certainly, what you'd want to do is find out where am I vulnerable in my enterprise? Right. Where, what machines do I have that are running this? vulnerable version. So that's one. Um, and so you'd probably even run a, a more recent assessment. You could, you could, you know, even though the vendors out there may not have emerged with a detection that detects this yet, they may have, but they may not have. You can probably still look at, you know, what, what, where is Apache 
and where are the vulnerable versions? Because many vulnerability management scanners and systems give a lot of insight, even though they, they'll, they'll tell you what application versions, et cetera. Uh, and in this case, you know, this is, this is something that you could do. But still, you'd probably want to run a more recent assessment across your enterprise to find out where the vulnerabilities lie. But that's actually not enough, or said differently. We've evolved across time to handle you know, more complex use cases. And this is where I share in step two, where what you'd like to do in addition to step one is to understand, you'd like to look into the past and say, well, it's possible that I actually was running Apache on certain machines where I deinstalled it, or maybe I did have a vulnerable version, but I upgraded for whatever reason. I mean, the most, more, most recent version of Apache has been out for a while here. And so, um, so you'd do that, right? So I'm showing a diagram here, which sort of puts this into perspective. Um, and I like these timing diagrams, because a lot of this talk um, brings in the dimension of time, right? And we'll talk a little more about that in a second. The right side of the diagram is showing us um, instances of where we're vulnerable now. So it's, it's sort of like a little tacky network diagram, but the red dots are illustrating you know, where Apache is installed at that vulnerable version, right? So at least, wow, yeah, we know. We know we have three instances. We can prioritize these. We can you know, figure out if we want to solve them and, and remediate them right away or not. But now if you look into the left side of the diagram, there's a lot more red dots. And, and what I'm showing here is the possibility of where some, at some point in the past, you may have had you know, Apache installed uh, at the vulnerable version, but whereas today you don't. Because, for example, you might have deinstalled Apache, didn't need it anymore, or maybe you've upgraded, right? And so from an attacker's perspective, or from a security professional's perspective, you, you may say, well, it's very possible that although we know about this problem today, this vulnerability today, it's very possible that the hackers, or some hackers, have known about this problem in the past. And because of that, they may have actually compromised some of our systems. So you could take this intelligence, right, this vulnerability intelligence, as I say, which lives only in vulnerability land, and you can feed that into your incident response program to sort of, you know, investigate, look, look to see other, you know, other, other indicators where, you know, maybe I've already been compromised on this, because your incident response program might have missed these instances in the past. So this is a pretty cool use case. So I'm showing a diagram here, which is essentially the same, and all I'm showing you is, you know, I'm kind of relating the endpoints to give you better understanding of, you know, the past and the present, right? So it's very important to be able to relate what's been seen in the past to what's been seen in the present in order to solve this, this use case. Here's another timing diagram that I like to use, and I'm going to be using this kind of diagram throughout my talk, okay? So we'll just talk a little bit about this. So the bottom part of the diagram, it, what I'm showing there is three assets, three computers. These are the computers that you can touch. You know they're there, right? They, they're like, as a human being, I can stand here all day and I, I can feel this computer. Uh, assume that's asset A. Um, whereas vulnerability management systems that are, you know, assessing these computers across time they're not just doing it in one shot. Maybe in the very, very olden days, that's what a lot of organizations did. They ran a vulnerability assessment once a year. They may or may not have fixed problems. But nowadays, we're running scans daily, weekly, even sometimes continuously, right? So I'm showing in the, in the top part of the diagram two different points in time where a vulnerability scanner or a vulnerability management system, this is how they viewed these assets across time, okay? Does that make sense? So we got a little break here. Um, just if someone already knows what this problem is, you can raise your hand. Great. Over here? I think I do. Okay. Okay. Pretty, pretty good, pretty good. I'm not sure if it's exactly it, um, but it might be. So we'll just hold on to that one. 
we'll hold on to it. We'll, we'll continue. Um, time has changed, change has time. I couldn't really find something that's sort of more Zenish than this. I've gotten into Buddhism over the last couple of years. And, uh, but anyway, it's, this is sort of our little break point. So let's, let's get into um, different scanning technologies to sort of give us a little more clues, a little more detail, right? So vulnerability management vendors um, scan in different ways. They use different technologies. And I'm not showing all of the technologies here. There's, there's one that uh, one of the sponsors here has, um, which is pretty cool. It's called passive, passive scanning. That's not up here. Um, but nevertheless, all of these technologies um, that I'm getting into, some have this issue and some do not. So agent-based, let's talk about agent-based. In agent-based scanning, this is where uh, the vendor has come up with agents. They're like programs that, that run on the endpoints. So there may be a centralized scanning solution that interacts with these agents to signal it to do a scan, start scan. But the actual scan itself is happening right on the, right the endpoint, right on the computer, right? So it's pretty accurate. So that's agent-based. Um, Credential-based is a technology where uh, the scanning engine is remote to, to the device it's scanning, but you can set up a set of credentials on the endpoints and in some form or fashion and also in the vulnerability management system and then the engine will authenticate to the endpoint and once authenticated it could get registry keys, files, different things like that. It could even drop if it has the right, you know, right privileges an endpoint or a program right on the, right on the, the endpoint. Um, so in that regard it, it's sort of very similar to agent based but nevertheless it's a little different, right, because you have to set up credentials, etc. Um, so it's also quite accurate, um, but it does have some IT overhead. We'll talk about that in a second. And then thirdly, uh, we have the remote unauthenticated or re remote network unauthenticated scanning. And this is where, once again, the scanning engine is remote to the endpoints that it's scanning. It's not on the endpoints. It's not on those hosts. Um, in fact, in this case, it doesn't use any credentials. You go into the vulnerability management system. You set up a set of ranges or maybe domains, and it will use internet messages. It'll message these endpoints. It'll send ping, sweeps, et cetera. Is there an endpoint there or not? And if there isn't, it moves on. If there is, um, you know, it continues on with open ports. It tries to find what OS it is. It looks at uh, what applications are running and obviously looks at what vulnerabilities are present, right? So that's um, remote unauthenticated. So there's advantages and disadvantages of each of these um, different scanning technologies. I'm gonna start out in the reverse order this time. I'm gonna talk about the last one, remote unauthenticated. So just take a step back. All of the vendors, including Digital Defense, which is the company I work for, we use um, different techniques, technologies. Um, I don't think there's anyone that actually just uses agent base, but most of us use um, at least two of these technologies. So we'll use remote unauthenticated, or as a client, you're gonna re use remote unauthenticated to cast the wide net, right? Because there's no OIT overhead to do so. You just set a, plop a bunch of scanners down, and in the case of you know, external vulnerability assessments, um, if you're using a cloud-based, you don't even need to do anything because the scanners are just scanning you from external. But anyway, the key message is very low overhead, and it, it's pretty good. It, it detects quite a few things. It, this is how the hacker actually views it. I mean, if the hacker's on your endpoint, likely you're probably already hacked unless you know, there's an escalation of privilege required. But anyway, I digress. So that's remote unauthenticated. So as a client, as an organization, you'll be using that technology by and large to cast a wide net across time at regular intervals, weekly, daily, whatever. Then the others, agent-based and credential-based, if you know where you're... Um, well, first of all, if you're able to do this across the board, that's good for you. But um, agent-based and credential-based have high IT overhead, right? And they don't, they're, they're sporadic in that you, you don't have agents for every type of device. You don't have agents for routers, and you know, it's hard to credentialize these things, and you probably don't want to keep your credentials set up forever, et cetera. So there are some disadvantages to those, but there's certainly, it's better to use those because they're deeper, right? Because you're on the endpoints, 
you can get a lot more information of the vulnerabilities. Um, Adobe vulnerabilities, for example, you can't see remotely, right, because they're not internet facing. So you'll have to use credential based or agent based to find those types of things. So there's a mixture of these different technologies that one would use. Um, and so a key message here is, by and large, remote unauthenticated or remote network un unauthenticated is used. You can't get away from it. You're gonna be using it to some extent. Um, so takeaways, most vulnerability management vendors use uh, or at least provide you, the client, the enterprise, with the technique of remote unauthenticated scanning. But then of course, uh, you, 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 they'll also give you uh, credential based or agent based and you can use these depending upon your use case, right? Um, so if you know where your high value assets are, um, you would use, you'd use uh, credential based. You'd spend a little bit more money to use credential based or agent based, right? Um, organizations employ remote scanning on a recurring basis across time um, to cast a wide net because it's easy, right? Low IT overhead. Um, and once again, they'll use credential based for, or, or, or agent based for high risk assets. So we're getting closer. One question that you might ask is, is, especially when you're looking at that timing diagram that I showed earlier on, where you saw the different endpoints being scanned at different points in time, and the real world assets at the bottom that you can touch, well, you'd wonder, okay, how does the system know that the endpoints in one point in time are related to the correct counterparts at a different point in time? That would be a question that you'd wonder about, right? And that's what this talks about, essentially. So how do the vendors do this? So they use various, what I call, um, network detectable ca characteristics as their match key, right? So certainly IP address is used quite heavily, um, but there other vendors use various host names. MAC address is a good one, although as evolution has occurred, not necessarily for virtualized environments. Um, host types, lots of other different characteristics that these vendors use, okay? So this is just to give you a little idea. Um, so in my research, I looked at, I looked out there and I tried to understand, well, what do these vendors, you know, like what do specific vendors do and, and how accurate is it? And so I found um, this algorithm, which is actually, it's pretty cool because they actually describe it um, right on their website. Um, and they call it host tracking and, um, or the pro they call the problem host tracking. I call this algorithm single host tracking key where the administrator is allowed or able to go in and specify which one to choose. So if you think about this algorithm, you can think about your fingerprint. And if you look at a fingerprint, um, in, in this example, you as the administrator of the vulnerability management system can come in and indicate I want to use characteristic A or characteristic B or characteristic C. It's not all three at the same time, it's one. So you choose one and it depends on what type of host you have. So if you have laptops, right, or desktops that are in DHCP ranges, you're not gonna choose IP address. But incidentally, if you don't even know about this problem and you just wanted to you know, install your scanners quickly and start scanning your environment, by default, it's gonna use IP address. And that's the only thing it's gonna use to track. So after a while, when you start discovering some issues, which we'll talk about later, You'll then go into the system and you'll say, oh, okay, this is in a DHCP range. I think I'll use NetBIOS hostname as an example, right? So it's one of these three that you could use. And this is, this is an example of one of the largest vendors out there. Incidentally, they're not a sponsor here. So I'm just sharing that. So I was curious. I was curious because when I started at Digital Defense, um, in the first iteration when I was there, very, very young system, I guess, very, you know, put together with, uh, as Spock would say, I'm a Star Trek fan, um, stone knives and bearskins. But anyway, um, I remember I was in the lab because we had some clients who were, uh, you know, they had these bugs, as we call them, right? And um, I couldn't actually solve it because our database relations were the way they were, right? So I was trying to move data around to sort of get things to work, but the key message is, 
I, did a, I, I understood this issue when I was very, very young at Digital Defense. Not to say that I'm young, but young meaning I just started there, right? And so I wondered, how could I solve this issue? How could I, uh, how could I, how, how could I make it better? And so I came out with an algorithm that is still being used and that's been evolved. But of course, with anything that's complex in the world of software, if there's some software developers here, you understand you're always going to have some bugs. It doesn't matter how good you are, right? Um, and it's not just you, it's your whole team. And so there's an investment, right? So as you start getting more mature in your career, you understand, yeah, there's software and then there's economics, right? And so the more complex you, you make a feature, you have to think about the economics involved in that, right? And so I wonder, did we waste our time with this? Because we're, you know, we're having to babysit this algorithm, evolve it, and et cetera. And so I said, you know, let me do a study. And I went out there and I tried to understand, well, how often do these characteristics that these vendors use to track the endpoints across time or the hosts across time, how often do these characteristics change? And of course, you know, if you're talking about laptops, you're going to realize or at least intuitively know that your IP addresses are not going to stay static forever because you're in the DHCP range. So that makes sense, right? So what I did is I looked, I looked, and because we're like a cloud-based or SaaS base, we have a lot of data, and we can talk about how I did this analysis if you're interested. Um, but I, I, I categorized different devices into server-type devices, client-type devices, laptops, desktops, um, printers, uh, you know, different routers, et cetera, different types of devices. And I looked across time. And my goal was to understand how often do these characteristics change across time. So I took a time slice of three months. The study actually covered like over a year, but I took a time slice of three months and I said, okay, if a characteristic changes at least once across that three month time period, that's a flag, that's a count, right? And so, I'm listing two different categories of devices here. Servers and client type devices. Servers are database servers, web servers, those kind of types of servers that actually serve. And client type devices are like laptops or you have your, you know, your, your Google Chrome, et cetera, or you're doing work, you're writing Word docs, et cetera, right? So server type characteristics, you would think that if you have a server, it's not gonna change characteristics much. You plop it down, you know, you give it an IP address, you give it a domain, dom maybe a domain name, etc. And you think it's not going to change much. Um, but actually it, it changes more frequently than what we would have thought. And so my analysis shows, my, my analysis and my team shows that, for example, even just IP address changes at 4% across a three-month time period. So if you think of an organization, a large organization that has, for example, 100,000 servers in their organization, and you're doing vulnerability management, vulnerability scanning as time goes on, or even if you're not doing vulnerability scanning, the point is those characteristics that are being used as, as match keys change. They're moving. And so 4% of those, that's 4,000 devices may not be much, but it compounds over time. It's like the compounding value of money, right? It's like interest. So after another three months, you get another 4%, and even the original 4% changes again, if that makes sense, at a 4% rate. So that's IP address. And then the other characteristics are listed here. I'm only listing three characteristics, but the study actually uh, covers much more. And if you're interested, the link's at the bottom there. I know it's probably hard to see, but hopefully the slides are available uh, afterwards and you can get to it. Uh, but it's on my website, uh, my company's website, right? So things change. So the takeaway here is if you look at a given asset, a given endpoint, a given host, I'm using these different terms interchangeably, as time progresses, those things that we see from a remote perspective, right? When we're back here as a scanner and we're looking and we're sending messages out and we're getting responses back. We're saying, okay, this is what we're seeing for this device right now. But if I scan it next week, will I see the same? That's the question. The answer is, to some extent, yes. But to a large extent, no. So this is the point in time where I actually, uh, and I've kind of been scanning to see if there's any hands up, but 
this is the point in time where I reveal this limitation, this flaw, right? So let's bring it together, um, and then we'll talk about consequences. The most widely used scanning technology is remote unauthenticated. Okay, we talked about that. Most vendors uh, will, will track hosts, track point in time scanned endpoints using a limited set of these characteristics that I mentioned. For example, IP address, DNS hostname, net bias hostname. In the example I gave you of the large vendor, you could actually go in and specify which one so you have some control. But even then, it's still not enough. And other vendors, actually, you, you don't have control, which is good because it's hands off. But if you have a problem, how do you fix it? Um, third point, all remotely discoverable characteristics are subject to change. And the study that we've done actually shows that it changes quite frequently, more than what we would have thought. So what is this flaw? What is this problem? It's that vulnerability management systems often track point in time you know, scanned endpoints, and they make mistakes. And we'll go through those mistakes, the consequences. There's two different types of consequences. Asset duplication and asset mismatch. And I have my opinion as, as to which one's more severe, but let's, uh, let's look at these. Okay. Very true. Yes, very true. Yeah. Okay, great. So consequences of this uh, of this flaw: asset mismatch. So here's here's that diagram again where I'm showing asset A, B, and C, right? So imagine, you know, here I am in week one, I do my scan, I see three endpoints, red, yellow, and the black endpoint. And uh, I don't know if you can see this, but essentially there are different characteristics up there. There's IP address, there's DNS hosting, net bias hosting, MAC address, et cetera, at the, on the different endpoint or hosts. Some point between, uh, at some point between scan week one and scan week two, there's been some IT, you know, someone in IT, and, you, and keep in mind, and you know, when you're in a large enterprise, often what happens is this, there's a centralized security team that manages vulnerability management and other security tools, and then you have maybe even multiple IT teams spread out throughout the organization that you, you know, ass ass assign remediation out to, et cetera. Um, and then thirdly, you have these IT people that are, you know, making things, making sure things stay up, moving things around, moving printers around, et cetera, right? So they're doing IT work, right? And they don't necessarily even know that there's a vulnerability management program in place. They're just, their goal in life is to keep things running. And they don't necessarily communicate together. So it's not like someone's going to be like, oh, I better not change this because, you know, it, what they're thinking about users, certainly, but they're not necessarily thinking about the vulnerability management management team who's actually, you know, trying to measure risk and trying to, you know, drive out risk. So anyway, this is a situation where in week two, we see that the yellow node and the red node experienced an IP address change and as a result, the vulnerability management system actually, uh, if I had a pointer, I'd show this, the asset A uh, is actually mismatched. Um, and so what happens is the red, the red asset originally was the red asset, but now the vulnerability management system thinks it's the actual yellow one. And what happens in this case is, if you imagine a situation to, make, to, to sort of make it simple, imagine a situation where the red asset and the yellow asset, they both have vulnerabilities, but their sets are completely disjoint. They don't have vulnerabilities in common. Let's just make that assumption right now. The vulnerability management system, after this mismatch had occurred, what it will do is it will declare all of the vulnerabilities that were there, that were present, that were scanned in week one, as having been fixed. Because it doesn't see them anymore, right? Because of the mismatch. And so you're like, yay, I solved all those vulnerabilities. But it's like, well, wait a second. No, I didn't really. Um, and of course, it'll also declare new ones, those of the yellow, right? So that's a mismatch, um, pretty serious. A lot of the times it's hard to tell because you have so many hosts in your organization and you're running this program on a continuous basis, so it's difficult to see. Often you'll see something and it's like, I don't know what's wrong, there's something wrong here. 
Um, and this is what's happening often. Uh, asset duplication is, is, other than the one that the gentleman over there mentioned, um, is the second type of flaw. So in this scenario, imagine time has gone by, now we're at week 23, and we've solved the issue of the red host, because what happened is we said, hey, let's use a different match key, let's use uh, DNS host name, because uh, that thing doesn't seem to change as much, and you know we have a, a, a naming server, and so let's do that for this thing, that's great. So we see that in week 24, when the scan ran, the red endpoint is correctly matched, and that's good. But the problem is um, the yellow endpoint, which just hap so happened to have the same IP as the red one originally, which has a different IP than what it had in week 23, and it was actually still using IP address as a match key. And as a result, the system says, well, I've never seen this endpoint before. It must be new. Let me add it to my asset list. So now instead of having three assets, I have four, which is kind of cool from the vendor's perspective if they're charging by IP address because now you're actually spending more money. But in fact, you still, you only have three endpoints. You really don't have four, right? Um, so this is an issue, right? This, is, this could happen. So as you, you know, in the olden days, digital defense actually had these issues and we evolved it, but we had a very large client and we had a certain set of assets in the asset list and it was growing and it was growing and it was growing. And we're monitoring it and we're like, what's going on? There's something wrong. So that's been fixed and stuff many, many years ago. It's been over 10 years. But the key message is all vendors are susceptible to this challenge. So these are not the hosts you're looking for. So I'm a Star Trek fan, but I couldn't find anything on Star Trek. Um, I like Star Wars too, so anyway. How are we doing on time? Pretty okay. Impacts. Now you could, you could imagine some of the impacts now, I'm assuming, right, based upon what we talked about. Um, I call these DevOps and SecOps impacts. And, and I have a lot of stories on this. There's, there's, a, I, there's something I call chasing ghosts. So we've had multiple prospects come to us and they tell us about stories, um, which is good because we're like, oh, we know what the problem is, and we shared with them you know, how, how our technology solves it. But anyway, the story, the story is where, before I kind of alluded or start, started it a little bit, where in large organizations, you, you have these humongous teams, right? And you have a centralized security team, and then you have IT teams out there, right? So this prospect, who's now a client, came to us, and they, and they told us this story where the vul they, were, they were doing this scan, and because of the mismatches, they were taking the vulnerabilities and assigning them out to the wrong IT team, thinking that they owned these assets, when in fact it was just due to a mismatch. And so what happened was the people who were receiving these problems these vulnerabilities to solve, they were like, okay, that's great, let me go investigate, and they would spend time investigating, learning about the vulnerability, which is a good thing, so it's not really wasted, I guess, if they had that vulnerability really to fix. Um, but then when it came time to actually find the device, it took them a long time to figure out, this isn't even our, this isn't, isn't even our device, you misassigned it. And so that's what I call chasing ghosts. So there's a lot of money spent um, you know, chasing ghosts and, and, and wasting time. Um, mismatched scanned endpoints, as I mentioned before, where, oh, all my vulnerabilities have been solved. That actually gives you a false sense of security. So this is, this is sort of like, this is pretty serious. I mean, when you look at vulnerability management systems, nowadays we're, we're all pretty good at scanning, you know. I mean, yeah, we, you know, a lot, of, a lot of clients or prospects will, when they're vetting out different vendors, they will run a scan on a specific you know, test bed, and they'll do that for all the different vendors, but they're really just running one scan. They're not, and, and they're looking at, well, how accurate is it? And, okay, great, and, and that's good. And maybe in the olden days, you know, we would have seen some vendors have a lot more coverage than others. But one of the things that I know that these prospects don't do is actually take into account this time drift, right? Run scans across time. What happens if, you're, if, you're, uh, if your endpoints actually change, right? Change these characteristics. So that's uh, sort of my spiel on that. Um, 
Vulnerabilities declared fixed when in fact they're not, uh, so that's a problem. And one of the things that I, you know, in some other talks that I give is that as, as a security general, like, like a CISO or, you know, a, a CIO, et cetera, um, you're looking at this vulnerability management system as a gauge for your risk, right? And you're using this information to make important decisions. What if this gauge is off? That's what I say, and I've seen it. So obviously the ideal scan to scan endpoint correlation solution is to get everything right. It doesn't always happen, um, but there are some solutions out there, including digital defense, that actually um, we use uh, we use everything we can see, right? So it's kind of like instead of just using one thing on your fingerprint, why not look at everything? And so that's what we do. We look at um, all of those characteristics I mentioned. We look at what ports are open. We look at what applications are running. We look at um, all the way down to vulnerabilities. And granted, vulnerabilities are going to change a lot. They're going to be solved. But we still use them in a different weighted fashion, if that makes sense. We don't look at every characteristic and say, oh, that's, that's so important. That's the way. Different characteristics have different weights. That sort of, and, the, and when I say weights, they're weights as it relates to change, right? And so as time evolves, these, these weights may change too because just because you know, it is the way it is today doesn't mean that in the future something's not gonna change. So for example, MAC addresses for virtualized environments, it's my understanding when machines go up and down, they actually sometimes get allocated different MAC addresses. So you can't use MAC addresses necessarily as a very hardcore um, uh, characteristic for tracking. What can you do? Well, one thing is be aware of it, and hopefully now you are. Um, I'm not sure if this is new to some people. Is it, is it something that makes sense? Uh, is it something that you were aware about? But if not, hopefully you are aware about it now. Um, and then secondly, um, there's a third thing, but secondly, and when, when you're benchmarking uh, vendors, when you're looking at solutions, be aware of this problem and see, well, and ask them, how do you solve this issue? Um, if they say something like, oh, don't worry, you'll just use credential-based scanning all over the board. Well, that's not easy to do all the time, right? Um, the other thing you can do is do your own correlation. Um, it's my understanding that there's some other security products that pull in vulnerability scans uh, from different vendors and they do correlation. So they somehow solve this problem and my assumption is that they're doing it in very similar fashion as to what, as what we're doing, right? So wrap up and then we can get to questions. His, historical security information is key. Um, it's not just now, as I was mentioning before. When you look at time, when you look at impermanence, Impermanence is, is something that, you know, if there's anything that's absolute, change is absolute. And, you know, with change comes another dimension of complexity. Um, network endpoints slash host change characteristics. But why did they change? We actually interviewed people um, when we were doing this study, uh, some of our clients, to sort of validate and make sure, hey, what's going on here? And they would tell us things like, well, we're doing name changes. We have a new naming convention, so we're changing all of our you know, domain names, et cetera, and so, so that's one reason. And, and there's a lot of different reasons, but the key message is they're, they're not doing these things to, to cause problems. In fact, they're unaware that they're causing problems, right? Um, most vulnerability management solutions are good with one-point in-time assessments, as I mentioned before. I mean, you can benchmark them with just one scan, and you'll probably see some differences and some strengths, et cetera, but by and large, they're nowadays the same. They're, it's, a, it's a pretty mature market. Um, and then finally, when you're selecting a vendor, keep this in mind. Um, ideally, uh, move stuff around and see how, how, the, how the solution responds. So I think we're really good on time, a little dirty, which is okay. Um, questions? Absolutely. So, in fact, that's why I kind of shared the difference between remote unauthenticated versus the other technologies is credentialed or agent-based, you could, you're, you can, you could, there are techniques where you could actually, like, for example, agent-based. 
you're on the computer, so you can give it a specific ID that's unique. And so the next, and it's credential based, same thing, you could actually deposit something like an ID there that's unique. And so the next time you come back and do another credential scan, you'd be like, well, I did, did I deposit a, a, an ID there before? Oh, I did. Oh, okay, so now I can correlate it. So those technologies are not susceptible to this problem, if that makes sense. Well, actually, uh, I wonder who you're working for <laughs> because there is a vendor that does that, yeah. Right, and that's cool. But again, that's assuming that, you know, that, that, that the reason that the IP changed was because it just got a new IP due to a DHCP. And that works great um, for that case. But for the case of servers that I mentioned where, you know, the, the IP address is changing but it's not in a DHCP range, you're not going to see that in your DHCP logs. And so, if that makes sense, you know. So, very good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been a while. It's large. I want to say it's definitely over a million endpoints, over a million hosts. Um, and we actually subdivided it into large enterprise, medium, and small. So this, what I'm showing is actually a medium enterprise, what I was showing you. Um, it's kind of like taking the average of the two because smaller ones don't, you know, there's, the changes are actually different for the different sizes, which was interesting to us, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Others? Thank you so much. Appreciate it.